Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. We have invited four people to share their experience, strength, and hope on the topic of singleness of purpose. Our panelists will be Jamie W. from Sacramento, California. Yeah. Joe F. from Cleveland, Ohio. Susan H. from Phoenix, Arizona. And Mike F. from Chandler, Arizona. And with that, our first speaker will be Jamie. Hi, my name is Jamie. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, I love you too. Um, Can you hear my heart beating right now? (laughs) Oh gosh. First of all, I want to thank the host committee for asking me to be of service. It's truly an honor and a privilege, um, you know, to to show up and, and be asked to participate. And so far from what I've seen, this has been an absolutely superb convention. And so if any of the host committee members are in here or anyone being a service this weekend, um, thank you so much for your service. I have had the privilege of being able to participate in my state's young people's convention in some pretty incredible capacities. And so... Um, I was a part of, of the host committee for ACIPA in 2008, and I know all of the hard work um, that goes into putting putting this on. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Um, I have a sobriety date. It's September 9th of 2002. And when I got here and they mentioned we were going in order of sobriety, um, my first thought was like, oh, that's great. I have 10 years. I'll be somewhere in the middle and, and, um, I'm first. So, uh, <laughs> which is really cool. You know, it's it, with 10 years of sobriety, I'm the baby up here. Um, and I have a home group. It's called Too Young. We meet on Thursday nights at 7:30 in Sacramento, California at St. Mark's United Methodist Church. If you are ever in the area, please come and join us. It's a superb meeting. It's been my home group for 10 years. Um, I, I owe my life to, to that room. And I have a sponsor. She knows that she's my sponsor. Uh, I, <laughs> it's important. Like, I've gone through some stretches of sobriety where uh, kind of dipped off the face of the planet for a while. Um, I am a sponsor. I, I know that I am a sponsor um, because I meet with, with uh, right now I currently have one sponsee, but um, we meet on a weekly basis and we read out of this book. Um, I'm a service to Alcoholics Anonymous. I've held a service position ever since I had 90 days of sobriety. And I, uh, I, I take my recovery very, very seriously. Um, I also absolutely have a ton of fun, but I, we're, you know, we're here today to talk about our singleness of purpose and the 12 traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous saved my life long before the steps ever had a chance to. And so because of that, I, I hold, uh, I hold the traditions, um, just in my heart. And to me, they're very sacred. I come from a family of alcoholics. I'm also very blessed to have recovery in my family. So the tradition of, uh, traction rather than promotion was practiced in my home. And I think that, uh, my mom got sober um, my mom got sober about six months before I took my first drink, so it was really unfortunate timing. But, you know, she, she, but because of that, you know, I knew where to come. And, and when, you know, life got, uh, 
to that point where I could no longer imagine my life with or without alcohol, and I was a shell of a human being and um, completely devastated everything in my life and every moral and every value that I had had, uh, I had an example of Alcoholics Anonymous in my home. And I knew um, I knew that these rooms were, were open to me if I, you know, wanted them to be. And I wasn't so sure when I first got here. You know, I wasn't, um, I attended six meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous over a six-week time period when I was 16 years old. And in in that time period, um, I wasn't ready to to take my first step. Um, but what I, I what I got to do in those six weeks is I, I got to learn about the disease of alcoholism. I got to learn, um, you know, the fundamental difference between me and someone that is not an alcoholic. Um, I got to hear people read from the doctor's opinion. I got to hear experience, strength, and hope shared. On, um, on what, you know, that there is a solution here. And I got to, to read portions out of the book book that say, you are the only one that can determine if you are an alcoholic. Um, it is only for you to decide. And if you decide that you are, there is a solution here for you. And if you're unsure, here are some things that you can try. Um, and I was grateful for those suggestions because I needed to take a few of them in order to to fully concede to my innermost self that um, I am bodily and mentally different from my fellows when it comes to oh, when it comes to alcohol. Um, I'm going to read here the briefly just the the long form of of our fifth tradition, and that's each Alcoholics Anonymous group ought to be a spiritual entity having but one primary purpose, that of carrying its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. And my understanding of that message is that um, I am I have a you know seemingly hopeless disease and I'm powerless over alcohol and the only thing that can conquer that for me is a psychic change, also known as a spiritual solution, a power greater than myself. And I, I came to find that power through working the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous with a sponsor from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous with the 12 and 12, which is 12 traditions and 12 steps, um, to give some more, you know, information on our steps and then to turn around and to carry that message to the still-suffering alcoholic. That's what I've been doing for 10 years. It's been working pretty well for me. I'm still here. Relapse is not a part of my story, and I'm very blessed and grateful to be able to say that. And if it is a part of your story, I'm very gl- very happy and grateful that you are you're, were able to make it back to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, you know, I'm doing a little bit of research, and I may have over-researched, and now I feel like I'm at a complete loss of words. Um, but I, I found a recording of of Bill, um, Bill Wilson, one of our co-founders in 1957, who was speaking on this topic of, of singleness of purpose. And he talked about, um, you know, that, that many alcoholics have related problems. And... Um, it's very hard to find a pure drunk uh, these days. And, and I know for me, I mean, I'm definitely I'm far from pure um, in many senses of the word. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he talked about when they were forming these traditions, like they, they had, I mean, our traditions were formed out of trial and error, you know, and it's really messy in the beginning for, for a handful of years. Um, and the question came up, like, are we as Alcoholics Anonymous, going to take on all the world's problems. And what they decided was no. Um, AA is for, for alcoholics, no matter what other complications so alcoholics may have. And with that said, so for me, you know, the, the, for me, the singleness of purpose is, you know, it's to carry our message to alcoholic who still suffers, but in that, you know, we also have to take, to take into account um, our third tradition, that the 
only requirement for membership is the desire to stop drinking. You know, so I'm an alcoholic when I say I'm an alcoholic. I get to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous because I have a desire to stop drinking. And because I identify myself as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, I choose to respect our traditions and I, and, and I choose to, to limit my discussion as they can find to my problems with alcoholism in my home group. Um, you know, under group autonomy, you know, groups can decide whether or not they want to be an open meeting or a closed meeting. And I'm so very grateful for open meetings because that's where I got to attend for those six weeks to, to, to hear and to identify and to kind of process all of this information. Um, but you know, the group gets to decide that. And, um, and I've attended closed meetings and I've attended open meetings. Um, my home group is, is an open meeting and, um, and I'm, and it's a young people's meeting. And so we do get a lot of people, um, with other complications, you know, and, and what I also believe is so important in this whole equation is, um, you know, sponsorship, you know, and, and being able to, to work one-on-one with, with a newcomer who may, ex- may be experiencing some other complications. I'm using that word because that's what Bill used. And so it's just stuck in my head right now, uh, related problems, you know, and, and, um, you know, and we get, and we get to work through that stuff. Like we get to work through that stuff, but with the fundamental like principle that, you know, I'm here and I'm bonded with you because, because I'm a drunk, I'm an alcoholic, you know, it's, and, and in, in our literature, um, in, uh, tradition five in the 12 and 12, it, it opens up with shoemakers, um, stick to, stick to thy last. And it's funny cause I used to, uh, I had to move away for a little bit from where I first got sober and I attended this group called shoemakers and, um, and it's fantastic because we spoke, you know, the whole point of that meeting was, uh, to carry the message to the still suffering alcoholic. And it was, it was very recovery based and it was absolutely by far the meeting that saved my life when I had to, had to make that move. Um, you know, Bill mentions that to, you know, to, to, to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, you need to be able to do AA 12 step work, AA committee work, and be able to make an AA pitch from the podium. You know, and I, I absolutely, um, can attest that I, I can do all of those things. And, um, because I am a real alcoholic with a desire to stop drinking. And, and that's why I get to be here. Um, and then he, he also talks about, like, through fair application of these principles, singleness of purpose, you know, no endorsement and group autonomy, um, that sometimes that can, like, come in and help with, uh, you know, our, our ability to, to approach people, you know, that may have other related issues. Um, I want to stop by a quote that he, you know, I'll finish up with a quote um, from Bill. And he says, um, let us first preserve Alcoholics Anonymous. Then next, let us as individuals do what we can for the world around us. And, and that I take, I take to absolute heart because um, the true testament of my sobriety is how I'm living my life the other 23 hours that I'm out there in the world, not in here in a meeting with you, you know. So um, thank God for Alcoholics Anonymous because I get to, I, I wouldn't be alive with, without it. I firmly believe that. Um, thank, thank God for these, these traditions and 12 steps um, because I get to actually go out into my, my world and my family and, and be a, a member of society, and it's a great thing. So thank you for having me. Thank you to the rest of our panelists who will be speaking. And um, icky, icky, icky. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Please help me welcome our next speaker, Joe F. from Cleveland, Ohio. Thanks, Frank. Uh, Joe, alcoholic. Thank you. 
My sobriety date is February 2nd, 2000, and I am not the man. The man I am today is not the man that I was February 2nd, 2000, and I thank Alcoholics Anonymous for that. Uh, me, myself, and I could not stay sober, and I'm thoroughly convinced that with the help of you people and the teachers I found, my life has changed, and I'm sober, you know, and I'm happy being sober, and promises came into my life, which which I, I thought were not going to happen, but... um. You know, so for me, when I came, when I came into AA, you know, AA didn't need me. I needed AA more than AA needed me at the time. And, um, you know, so I can't, you know, I'm a complicated head, you know, I mean, I'm just a complicated drunk. So, so I have the tendency to really complicate things and not keep it as simple as it should be. And, um, you know, so I come in and I think I have these revolutionary ideas of how AA needs to change to suit me, right? And, um, you know, so I'm voicing my opinion to everybody in the meetings of how it needs to change. And uh, very simply, people who are active members of AA said, no, nah, AA doesn't need to change. You need to change, you know? And I think that's where the singleness of purpose for me comes into play because... You know, it's also just a matter of keep things simple. You know, AA's worked for so long, you know, and, don't, and it's like if it's not broke, why fix it? Um, and and I had teachers, you know, everything. You know, I had old timers that were able to uh, to very kindly deflate my ego when needed, and um, you know, in certain things. And I'd get on a tangent, you know, third, you know, month in. Three months in on a tangent about why he's not working for me and it's bogus and why people have to do this and, you know, or talk about this. And, and, and they would say, well, you know, when I started to drift and, 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 um, they would say, well, you know, those chairs need to get set up, man. Like, so, you know, just tell me about that later and just set the meeting up, you know, or the coffee pot needs to get clean. So why don't you do that? Or, you know what? People are coming in the room, shake hands. Go stand and, and shake hands. And uh, what I learned was that slowly but surely, you know, I, I learned how to um, act my way into good thinking um, and, because I couldn't figure this out. You know, I couldn't read the big book with another recovered alcoholic and, fig- and have a spiritual awakening. You know, I needed to physically act my way into this. I needed to act my way into good thinking and, um, you know, and, 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 um, you know, it, it started to work, you know, action and Alcoholics Anonymous started me to realize and to help to realize about how this thing works as a fellowship. And this fellowship, if you think about it, is pretty uh, new still, even at 80 or 90 years, it's young, man. Like this is a young fellowship. If you look at the whole spectrum of how this thing started and, and what it's all about, you know, and, and it's, and it's cool how, um, you know, we are people who would normally not mix, but yet here we are, and we're able to have this camaraderie that is, that's universal, you know, that's something of spirit, you know, it's, it's truly amazing. Um, you know, and I learned more about the singleness of purpose, uh, through, you know, that's when I was newly sober. I could, I could get in very masterly detail about specific experiences I had. But uh, but just very simply now, I'll say, look, I had to learn to keep it simple. You know, it was a complicated program. Uh, you know, it's a simple program for a complicated person. And uh, and people in the rooms helped me to just slowly simplify what I needed to do for that day. And, uh, you know, so I stayed sober a couple of years. I don't know how, be, you know, but but I did. And I started to feel good. And uh, and then I, I got a GSR service position at my home group, and, and then I had it learned about AA on that whole level, which really opened up a huge door because, you know, there's not a lot of people that are involved um, in that type. In Cleveland, at least, is considered a big, dark district because I could go to a, a, somebody's home group or a meeting and say, well, who's the GSR? And they'll go, uh, oh, what's, what's that, you know? But I got involved, and uh, what it taught me was really how A also works as a whole, and um, and that's the deal, man. So when people want to drift and say, well, you know, A should be this, and that, that, I said, well, do you realize they voted on it, like, last year in New York? And, like, the, there was a delegate of your area that, 
you know, if, if you were active in your home group, because every, everybody, every member of AA has a voice. You know, that's the deal. In your home group, if there's a GSR and there's a topic, like that home group, for example, you could uh, submit a story if you wanted to be printed in the next printing of the big book. You know, like you have that opportunity. Um, and so I learned that, you know, it's, it's been, it's been discussed, you know, in, in detail with, with all the members of AA that are, that are involved in, in, in service that anything that, you know, the singleness of purpose is, is, has been discussed, voted on, and that's what it is. And, uh, I just, and I think that, it's a way, you know, people kept reminding me, don't dilute the message of AA. You know, don't dilute it. You know, if I don't want to necessarily hear about your food addiction problems, I don't want to hear about your sex problems, you know, I don't, and it just don't dilute the message. And, uh, and if I drifted, they'd always say, well, let's find it in the book. You know, let's go to the big book and find it and keep it, you know, in that realm. And, uh, so I think the singleness of purpose most importantly just allows the program of AA to be presented to new members as it was to the people in the in the in the earlier days, you know. So people who were getting sober back in 35, 1940, it you know it keeps that message still present presented even in 2013. And uh, you know, and I'm and it, and if I have you know I have the right to uh, to go to my delegate of my area and say, hey, you know, can you can we can we do this and they'll vote on it? He might take it to GSO and you know, but uh, but that's another cool aspect about AA is, is that it's you have a voice. You know, if there's something you don't like the thing that AA does, like you could discuss it, vote on it, present it. If it passes, oh well. If not, then you know it was it was it was uh you know it, it, a group kind of, it was God's is the ultimate authority in my eyes. You know, the higher power, but. So I don't know, you know, with, um, that's it, you know, I'll just pass it to, uh, the next panelist and thanks for letting me share. Thank you, Joe. Please help me welcome our next speaker, Susan H. from Phoenix, Arizona. Home girl. Hi, my name is Susan Hall and I am an alcoholic. <laughs> oh, I love you too. <laughs> I have to admit, this is my first Ikipa convention, and it will not be my last. <laughs> yeah. Um, due to the principles of this program and everything that the founders have laid out before me, I have not had to take a drink since January 14th, 1986. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And the warmth that that creates in my heart is second to nothing. When I was first honored by being asked to sit, stand, um, speak on this panel, at first, I'm 27 years clean and sober, and my hand started sweating because the absolute most single important thing about alcoholics is to deliver the message of sobriety and to always have our hand there for anyone that needs to get sober to extend our hand and be there. And I thought, I can't blow this. Because it is a, a program, a convention of our youth. When I came into the program, first off, I was committed to AA when I was 20. Yeah, you know, sometimes we get helped here. And... <laughs> <laughs> when I walked in when I was 20 years old, mind you, this was back in what, 82, 83, 84, quite a while back. There wasn't icky paw. There was, the gr group I went to was all men and they were older and I was the only woman. 
And I walked in and I said, I'm an alcoholic addict. And they all stood up and said, honey, you're an alcoholic, and if you're an addict, this is the wrong meeting. Mind you, I was 20, 21 years old, and I thought, oh, my God. And they started talking about their stories, and I hadn't lost the house, and I hadn't lost the wife. And I walked out, and I left that meeting. I did not feel welcomed. Two years later, I walked into another meeting, and I raised my hand, and I said, I'm an alcoholic addict, and my name is Susan. And they, some old timer pulled me inside and said, you will stick to your discussion of alcoholic as you seem fit. We don't want to hear about your drugs. Needless to say, I had to walk out of that meeting again. I did not feel welcome. You know, as Jamie talked earlier, yeah, the program co-founders, the original group, developed this in 1935, but it wasn't until years later that this original group went out to our general service reps and said, we need to work on these traditions. And it took years and years of trial and tribulations to come up with our traditions as they are today. We've already mentioned it's Tradition 5 and Tradition 7 that talks about the singleness of purpose. When the convention got together in 1987, and because there was a lot of this rife and strife coming down about, do we limit it to just discussion of alcoholic? Uh, Most of our members have dual addictions. And are we closing the door and slamming the door on so many young people that are walking in here that are standing up at a podium and saying, I'm an alcoholic addict? And general service got together and said, okay, do we do this? Okay, at the first of the meeting, you will limit your speech to only matters pertaining to alcoholism. And the convention literally said, no, we will not say this is GSO-supported information and this will be read at the first of every open meeting and this will be read at the first of every closed AA meeting. But what they did was develop a blue card and said, if you want to say something, here are some words that we feel are appropriate. And you can go to general service office and you can order these blue cards to be read at the first of your meeting. And it does say that we ask that you limit your discussion to matters involving your alcoholism. Meetings should not, and I say should, and in my years of sobriety, I try to not use that, but Bill has stated the biggest problem that we are going to have in our growth as this program moves forward is when the groups become too rigid. He says that will be the downfall of Alcoholics Anonymous. The traditions were put together to protect us from ourselves, I don't know about you, but I have an ego. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm the only one in the room. But I don't know how many times (laughs) I've walked into a meeting and someone will go up to the program and say, our home group asked that you don't do this and you don't do this and you don't vape within 50 feet of the building and you don't park over here. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to go tell that person what they should and should not do. And as Joe mentioned, you have home groups to voice your voice. So here, let your voice be heard. Your general service rep can bring these up to the general service office level. But as Bill says, it's the rigidity in each of our groups that are going to be the downfall of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so we need to squelch our egos, and we need to squelch our strong and staunch opinions, go back, back to the bare basics of the traditions and say, okay, what is the purpose of Alcoholics Anonymous? It's to get it out there to the person that has a desire to stop drinking. A drug is a drug. Bill has said this. A drug is a drug. We have a disease process. Alcoholics Anonymous has said we are going to focus on alcoholism. And and that's it. You know, we don't want to close the door for anyone. But we also want to ensure that we maintain that singleness of purpose because if we move forward with this rigidity and if we let all these opinions start swaying us from those original traditions, AA will collapse. 
And if we collapse, then we're not there for the next person. And that's what Bill and the original group was trying to maintain, is to ensure that Alcoholics Anonymous was going to be there for whenever anyone found our door. It was opened and they were welcomed. The meeting that I finally was walked into, and when I said, I'm an alcoholic addict, they said, welcome. And then the next time I said, alcoholic addict, and I said that for a while. And as I kept listening, I kept realizing, you know, the root of my disease is alcoholism. Yeah, I started doing all sorts of other stuff. The bottom line was I had all this hate and loathing inside of me that I just did not want to feel. And when I was out there, there was all this stuff in every form that you could come up with. I smoked it, I snorted it, I took it, I shot it, I drank it, as long as I didn't have to fill. And when I kept listening to what they would say in the rooms, and they said, the singleness of purpose, we just ask that you please keep it focused to alcoholism. Work with your sponsor. You know, if you have other things you're having problems with, work with your sponsor. There are a number of programs that support each of these addictions that you're struggling with. Work with your sponsor. Here's some books. But while we're in this room, let's talk about alcoholism. Let's talk about how that is affecting us. Um, and I truly do believe that the strength of AA has been because the old timers that walked this path before me kept me focused and kept that singleness of purpose. I, I want to read a quote um, from Bill W. because I feel that this is the ultimate authority and this is from some GSO approved literature. And he writes, um, one of the best, um, wait a second, do, 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 do. Bill writes about one of the best AAs he knows, a man who had been doing drugs for years before joining AA. But prior to that, he had been a terrific alcoholic. Therefore, he should qualify for AA. And that he certainly did. Should groups today insist on duly addicted newcomers confining their discussion to alcoholism unknown? Should we require prospective members to identify their primary addiction before participating in a group? Or can we simply welcome these men and women and trust that they will come and listen and find their own way? And that's exactly what I did. I came in and I... <laughs> I remember when I first came in, and of course I'm just the smartest thing on this planet Earth. I'm an electronic engineer, and I had all these wonderful things to say. <laughs> and in the group they said, finally, shut up. <laughs> I was like, no, but you don't understand. And they said, sit down and shut up. You have absolutely nothing I want. Obviously what you have been doing is not working. Sit down and shut up. And I was like, wow. But because I was told, you know, the courts, they gave me an ultimatum, you go to jail or you go to AA. Um, I came in. And I sat there like this. And I came. And I finally shut up. And I listened. And I heard. And more importantly, I felt the wisdom And I saw it in your eyes. And it was like, wow. They're, they're not sitting here like this. <laughs> and they're laughing. And they're laughing at themselves. I don't get this. I mean, I'm blacking out and I'm falling down and I still have scars. And I still have my best friends waking up the next morning and saying, F you, get the hell out of my way. And it's like, you're my best friend. What do you mean? But they were laughing about those situations that they got drunk, blacked out, and fell down. And I thought, I don't get it. And I asked my sponsor, what I, uh, she says, sit down and shut up. <laughs> Open the big book. Read this. Underline what you see and what you hear. And she kept taking it back to alcohol. And, and I cannot even begin to stress how important that is. Um, it, it's kept me alive. It's, um, it has absolutely kept me alive. You know, one of Bill's favorite th sayings from, you know, literature that I've read is every group has the right to be wrong. 
And, and I hope that if you are duly addicted and you're walking into an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting and they are not welcoming you with open arms and accepting you for what you are and just helping you focus on your disease of alcoholism, but they are opening their arms up to you and welcoming you, I hope that your community has more than just that one meeting. I know our book, we have thousands. Phoenix, we are absolutely blessed with an amazing program here. And that's one of the things I tell my sponsees. You know, one, I want you to call me every day and I want you to go to 90 meetings in 90 days and, and read the book and open it up and blah, blah, blah. But I say, if you go to one meeting and you don't like it and you don't connect, try the next one on the list. If you don't connect with that one, go to the next one. You know, as Bill W. mentions, we can outline the singleness of purpose. We can give you guidelines to hold your meetings and what we should or shouldn't do. But he also knows that because it is human beings and we are going to run riot with our character defects, every meeting has the right to be wrong, and we have the right to choose different meetings that we go to. So um, keep searching for the meetings that welcome you. You are welcome here. Um, and, and if you find, and if you have problems finding a meeting, you see all the faces in this room. Just ask someone, help me find a great meeting. You know, this is my life. This is my situation. I need some help. But reach your hand out. You'll find another hand there ready to pick you up. Thank you. And please help me welcome our last speaker, Mike F. from Chandler, Arizona. I'm Mike. I'm an alcoholic. you guys too. My sobriety date is April 23rd, 1985, and for that I'm grateful. And I want to thank the committee for inviting me to share a few words on singleness of purpose today. And if it wasn't for our traditions, I wouldn't be here, and neither would any of you. Our first tradition says our common welfare comes first, that the personal recovery depends upon AA unity. And the only way that we have unity is if we begin to take these principles and do something with them. I first came to Alcoholics Anonymous after my first detox. That was in Children's Hospital. And I was 15 years old, and I went to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it was the bottom of a police station in Orchard Park, New York. And they went around the room that night, and they said, I'm Tom, and I'm an alcoholic, and I'm Dorothy, and I'm an alcoholic. And it came to me. And I said, I'm Mike, and I'm a problem drinker with alcoholic tendencies. (laughs) You know what they said? They said, keep coming back. They said, keep coming back. If you look like a duck and waddle like a duck and quack like a duck, you're probably a duck. What they were saying is, you're welcome here. And I'm not proud to stand here and tell you that I came back to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous on a regular basis for 10 years and I never got 30 days sober. And I was never asked to leave. You know, there's programs out there today. There's NAOA, CA, PA, GA, EA, SA, and on and on. From 1951 until now, there's been over 545 programs that have been granted permission to use the 12 steps and 12 traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous to take our program and to go out there and create fellowships of their own that work. I probably qualify for 90% of them. Yeah. <laughs> They are, they've got a new one, Paranoia Anonymous. You know. They've got an unlisted number. <laughs> they don't tell anybody where they meet. <laughs> and I was a tweaker long before it was fashionable, too. <laughs> 
And I remember pounding blankets on the windows because they were coming to get me. I remember being in the psychiatric ward and, 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 and going through that deal. And I remember what it was like to come into meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous wishing that my problem was drugs. Wishing that that was my problem so I wouldn't have to stop drinking. You see, because drinking was what I wanted to do. I did all that other stuff. I did everything that, that I could possibly do that was available to me at that time. I did it as quick as I could, as often as I could. Some of it really helped me to drink a lot more and talk fast. <laughs> like for days. <laughs> I came into the program when I, when I finally hit bottom. And I want you to know I wasn't a chronic relapser. You know, I wasn't one of these guys who relapsed. I just never got sober. I mean, I'd come in here and you people would bless yourself and stop drinking and you'd get happy. And you were coming to meetings and you were happy. And I was coming to meetings and every time I stopped drinking, I got sicker. I never got better. See, because I needed a solution. I need to apply certain disciplines and certain principles in my life so that I can begin to get well. And if I went to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and there was no solution there, I was in trouble. But what had to happen before I found the solution was I had to begin to get open-minded. I had to hit a bottom that was unlike any bottom that I had ever hit. And because I was out of options, they sent me to this guy in Texas. I grew up in Buffalo. And this guy got sober October 28, 1951. I'm just going to share a few things here for you, not to impress you, because that's not what I'm here for. I'm a one arm length away from my next drunk, just like everybody here. I am no different than, than anyone in Alcoholics Anonymous. That's why it's our common welfare. That's why these traditions say the only requirement. Right? That's why it says each group can be autonomous and make decisions that, that work for them. John got sober in October of 1951. His sponsor got sober in September of 1941. And his sponsor was Bill W. And he got sober in December of 1934. And I would sit at this man's feet and learn about the history of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I would ask him questions. And I'd say to him things like, John, you know I was a cokehead. You know I was a pillhead. You know I was a pothead. What do I do with that stuff? And he said, kid, I found that the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous when applied to my life on a regular basis, and I'm a step-working, reworking member of this program, and I have a sponsor, and I'm active in the program, and I'm active in service, that I have addressed all of the issues in my life through this program and through these steps. And he began to teach me how to do that. And when we got to those character defects, you know, I, if anybody in here is like hasn't dealt with your control issues, you might want to leave now. Okay. <laughs> all right. He taught me that I didn't that I had to be all inclusive. I had to be open minded. If I was in here and I was rigid, if I was controlling, then I was never going to have a sense of well being. I wasn't going to be able to be happy because people were never going to do what I wanted them to do the way I wanted them to do it. And as I began to study this wonderful program and these wonderful traditions, I found out that this anonymity is a spiritual foundation. What does that mean? You know, we look at anonymity and we think that's giving our last name or whatever. What did Bill mean by the spiritual foundation of our program? And I believe what he meant, and if we read the 12 and 12 and some of the other writings of Bill, we find out that what he was talking about was our personal desires. That what we had to do is we had to begin to sacrifice our personal desires so that we could create unity in Alcoholics Anonymous. So at the group level or at an individual level, whether I'm sponsoring someone or whatever the occasion is, when I'm working the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and I'm practicing these principles, it's going to require personal or self-sacrifice from me so that I can have this unity. 
And when I do that in my home, it works pretty good. When I do it in my AA group, it works pretty good. If I do it in my business, it works pretty good. What I find is these principles that were taught in Alcoholics Anonymous, this idea of personal sacrifice. A few years ago, my mother-in-law said to me, "Uh, would you consider having Grandma come and live with you? Grandma was 97 years old. She was uh, in a nursing home. It wasn't my grandma either. It was my wife's grandma. And she's in a nursing home, and she had been planted in there for years. And she was a total care patient. I didn't even know what a total care patient was. And I'm like, my AA deal, you know. Sure, bring it on, no problem. Grandma moving in, kids, we're going to make some changes around you. (laughs) (sighs) What happened was, Grandma moved in and everyone in the house had to personally sacrifice their own desires so that we could care for her. And we did that without expectation of return. See, Alcoholics Anonymous teaches us that what we do is we give of ourselves freely without expectation of return. And when we do that, we end up with this abundant life. We end up happy. We end up with all these things that we don't even know how we got them. It's like, wow, you know, when I came in here, I wanted a job, a girlfriend, and a car. I'd have taken a girl that had the other two, you know. I wasn't that picky. (laughs) what I found was the application of these principles give me so much more. And I've sat in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and seen people come into the meeting and say, I don't know what I am. Alcohol wasn't my drug of choice. Well, isn't somebody going to tell them they got to leave? Wait a minute. How about opening ourselves up to people who come in and helping them understand what an alcoholic is, taking the doctor's opinion and reading it with them and having some one-on-one and sharing with them our experience. I had a young man in the last year had some terrific things happen in his life and in the life of his family, and I talked with him, and you know, he, he really struggled with whether or not he was an alcoholic. And he's going to AA meetings. He was going to a lot of AA meetings. He's going to CA meetings. He's going to other meetings. He's, he's got he's got fellowship around him, and, and they're giving him some guidance. And, and lo and behold, he starts sponsoring someone. One long after he started sponsoring someone, he said to me, you know what? I'm an alcoholic. See, because once he began working with another person, he began to be able to recognize his own alcoholism through self-examination and the examination of another alcoholic. The thing that, that, that we struggle with is our fear. We're afraid someone's going to come in and ruin what is so wonderful, that has helped us, that is here for us. There's meanings everywhere. And we're, you know, alcoholism by nature is a disease of self-centeredness and fear. What are we afraid of? You know, some people have told me, well, I'm afraid that somebody will come into the rooms and they're not really an alcoholic, and then they'll be called on a 12-step call, and then they'll go on a 12-step call, and the person they're talking with won't be able to identify with them. Really? How many 12-step calls do you think some person that's not an alcoholic, so they've got to be a lonely heart or some other mental twist that makes them come to Alcoholics Anonymous because why would they continue to come? Why would they be on a 12-step list? Why would they have gotten the call? And do you really, is that what we're going to be afraid of? Man, I'm more afraid of sending somebody out of here that doesn't know if they're an alcoholic and having them die next week of alcoholism. That scares me. That frightens me. I don't think Alcoholics Anonymous should be all things to all people. I think what we ought to do is we ought to read and study our literature. I think what we ought to do is practice, practice the principles of this program, love and tolerance for others, all-inclusive, never exclusive, help people get an understanding. Alcoholics Anonymous and not a single member in Alcoholics Anonymous is qualified to tell someone else whether or not they're an alcoholic. That is an individual choice. AA doesn't do that. AA doesn't sanction what you talk about. It doesn't censor what you read. It doesn't censor what you say. A group conscience can say, in our group, we like you to talk 
about alcohol and how that alcohol affects you and what you're doing to overcome your alcoholism. That's cool. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. But in the big book it says we meet frequently so newcomers can discuss their problems. Well, now if you've got an alcoholic who also happens to just relapse 17 times on heroin and lost their home and they're on the street and they come in and they say, man, you know, this, this heroin's just killing me. And, and, and I relapsed on it. Well, is that any worse than someone coming in and saying, my mother died and I don't know how to handle that. See, they're talking about the problems that are they're in their life today. I don't think that it's our job to censor what they're saying. And if it is, then someone's probably going to censor what I'm saying. And I'm get the hook. No, seriously, I take this program very serious. I love the program. It saved my life. I have the opportunity to to spend a lot of time helping people to understand certain aspects of our program as they relate to the history, and I've been blessed and privileged to do those things. And I've been blessed and privileged to go to grow up in AA home and to be around and meet some of the pioneers and to be able to do some of the things. And I want you to know that that they encouraged me. They loved me. They said, kid, keep coming. You, you know, this program is you're you're the future of this program. You're, this program's going to be good because it's people like the men and the women that are here at this conference. You folks are the future of Alcoholics Anonymous. And and I feel, you know, I watched that meeting last night. We're in good hands, man. Thank you for that. We are. You know, Bill W. and Dr. Bob and Bill D. and my sponsor and my dad and all those other people who have gone before us look down upon us today. I want you to know I am confident they would say, keep trying to carry the message to that still suffering alcoholic. Keep extending that hand of kindness. It was freely extended to you when you found the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Keep trying to give freely what was given to you. Make it fun and make it free. Enjoy what you're doing. Be a good example of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because that's what we are. We're examples of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that means people are looking at us. And someone said, you might be the only big book that some new guy or girl get to see. And I kind of took that serious. I thought, you know what? If that's the case, I better take a look at how I'm presenting myself. And I hope that I can be relatively accurate and I give my experience and not my opinion and not tell people what to do, but show them what to do. See, people are watching you, and they can do what you do, but they might not be able to do what you say. But they can always do what you do. And they taught me, you have one book in, in one hand in the Alcoholics Anonymous book, and one hand with another drunk that you're working with, and the chances are you don't have a hand to pick up a drink with. It's that simple. But this rigidity, I, I fear that. In year two, Bill used to love to tell the story. In year two, this guy comes to the leader of a group. And he says, I have another malady, another problem that's even worse than alcoholism. Oh, well then, Bill says, they brought it to the leaders of the group and they discussed it. This was long before the traditions. And they were back and forth on it. What do we do? This terrible stigma that this guy has. He's an alcoholic, but he's got these other problems. And finally it came to the night that they're going to make the decision. And one of the members of the group, it happened to be Dr. Bob, said, this keeps going through my mind. What would the master do? The decision was made. She began to make reference in her reading of a, of a drug addict that contacted the World Service Office in early 1940s. His name was Dr. Tom, and Dr. Tom was down in Shelby, North Carolina, I believe. It might have been South Carolina. I think it's North Carolina. But uh, Tom was down in Shelby, North Carolina, and Tom was actually admitted to an institution a sanitarium for drug addicts. And he contacted the World Service Office because somebody had given him a big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he began to tell the staff workers in the office through letters what his problem was, and that he had previously been an alcoholic, 
but now he became a morphine addict. And while he was detoxing from morphine in the sanitarium, he got so bad he had bitten his lips. And they were all scarred. And he's communicating back and forth with these people. And he said, when I get out of here, I want to start a group. And they supported that, and they encouraged Tom to do that. And Tom went on, and he started a group in Shelby. And, boy, he met a lot of resistance from alcoholics because they weren't so sure that they wanted a group that was started by a drug addict. And Tom overcame those those adversities, and he continued to have the meetings, and alcoholics came. And Bill W. was going down to Atlanta on a trip, And he was trying to decide whether or not he ought to swing by Shelby. He was on a train. If he should go by uh, Shelby and see Dr. Tom and maybe the little group there in Shelby. And he's thinking, no, I better get to Atlanta. There's a lot more people there. And, you know, I am the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I probably need to be talking to the masses. And this is what's going through Bill's mind. And and Bill finally made a decision. He was going to stop off in Shelby. And he got off the train, and three alcoholics were walking toward him. And he, could, he said he, he noticed immediately that two of them were alcoholic. He could tell by looking at them. <laughs> he said, but the third I wasn't sure about. Well, that turned out to be Dr. Tom. And he got invited over to Dr. Tom's house that night. And they had dinner with Tom and his wife and his kids and probably a few AA members. And Bill said there was something peculiar about Dr. Tom. Now, the meeting, the group in Shelby had been going fine. He said, what was peculiar about Dr. Tom was he seemed to be humble. He seemed to be kind of subdued. He wasn't talking about himself like the typical alcoholics do. And Bill Bill jokingly said, I thought maybe it was the dope that had that reaction on him. And then he said, maybe more alcoholics should have taken more dope. Yeah, Bill was a guy who, who was inclusive. He went to the meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that night. They had him speak, and they sang church hymns at the meeting, and he talks about it. And it's like some people go to a meeting, they're singing church hymns, they leave. But you know, this is, what, this is how Alcoholics Anonymous developed. Before Bill left, one of, one of Dr. Tom's friends, sponsee, asked if he could have a private meeting with Bill. And Bill agreed to it. And this guy said, let me tell you about Tom. And he said, you know, Tom came here and he had the adversity and he had all of these difficulties. And he said, Tom has been a man of service to Alcoholics Anonymous. And there's this group and other groups that have started as a result of Tom and Tom's selfless work. And, you know, Tom was a doctor and he was a dope fiend. And he was rejected by the community. And they didn't want him here and he continued to serve. And last year, the community gathered together and they named Dr. Tom the Man of the Year of Shelby, North Carolina. Because Alcoholics Anonymous gave Tom the tools that he could have his life back better than he had ever had it. I hope that's your experience, too. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.